All right, I'm going to go ahead with the last part before lunch. Um, so for all of this effort that we spend coming up with trial ideas, uh, doing proposals, spending tons of money to do them, we actually, as physicians, do a pretty terrible job of penetrating these trial results into our practice and how we change our practice as a result of the studies. Uh, and in fact, one of the legacy committees of ACASOG, ACASOG's not completely dead, it's only partly dead, uh, but it's part of the alliance now, and one of its legacy committees is called the Dissemination and Implementation Committee, and somehow I'm on that committee. Um, but, you know, it's just an example that we need to actually make sure we get the word out about these trials so people start doing things differently and using the information. And I would say a perfect example of this is ACASOG Z30, that many of you participated in or led, showing that lymph node sampling is perfectly acceptable versus a lymph node dissection. And then the Commission on Cancer, which is part of the American College of Surgeons, comes along and says, oh, well, I don't really know about that trial, but you have to get 10 lymph nodes. So I just, it's shocking to me that the same organization, one side saying this and one side saying that. So just an example of how we have to make sure we pay attention to all the effort and uh, what goes into these research trials. So last year, or the year before, we started a little session called Whatever Happened to That Trial, and we wanted to make sure we keep reporting to all of you what are the results of these trials we work so hard to do and enroll to. This year, there aren't any new results on NCI-sponsored trials, but I think next year we'll have some that will be mature. Um, and in the meantime, Dennis and I talked about maybe it would be good to just um, to present to all of you, you know, what are the results of other completed trials, other things that are out there, what are things we should know about as thoracic surgeons that are happening. And some of us read a lot, some of us maybe don't read as much, so I made an effort to put together a summary of what's happened in the last year, and I'm going to give you a caveat, there was no scientific approach to how I came up with these articles. It was a little bit hodgepodge, some of it was word of mouth, some of it was looking at their sites and seeing what's most downloaded. So I promise you I've excluded some important trials and I'd be happy to have you add them in, but uh, this is what I came up with. So I wanted things that were potentially practice changing and also things that were trending, things you should just know about because people are talking about it. <clears throat> so starting with the annals of surgery, there's two main papers that are relevant to our practice. The first one comes from uh, Tommy D'Amico and his colleagues and they looked at uh, NCDB database, um, looking at long-term outcomes for VATS versus open lobectomies, a topic we hear about all the time. But they looked at, um, oh, let me get the correct pointer here, uh, over 7,000 lobectomies, and then they were able to create propensity matched pairs to compare them. <clears throat> and unfortunately, this may be as good as we ever get at randomizing this thing. It's just very tough to randomize this. We've all tried to do it, and there's always issues. But essentially what they came up with with comparing these propensity match pairs was that there was a one day shorter length of stay with fats versus open. Uh, and that when you looked at the oncologic outcomes of um, survival and other oncologic endpoints that basically it was the same and that answers that, so hopefully answers that question of are we doing as good of a cancer operation by VATS versus open and this is pretty close to saying that they're the same and I believe this was all stage one patients. I'm just going to make an editorial comment here. This has come up in some discussions that <clears throat> the length of stay issue is really the only difference and I think there's a bias there. People who are adopting VAT surgery are more forward thinking, they're gonna be a little bit more aggressive with everything that they do, including their management. And I, my thought is that they're probably gonna push the envelope a little bit on getting their patients out of the hospital faster, taking chest tubes out earlier. So I think that endpoint, you have to consider that, that there may be some inherent bias that you've got people who've done it the same way for 30 years and they do it open and they're maybe not gonna move their patients along as fast as someone who's a VAT surgeon. But other than that, I think we can fairly safely say that for a stage one patient, VATS for open is oncologically equivalent. Um, the next one is almost the same idea, but in esophagectomy, and this is a longer term follow-up of the TIME trial, which compared minimally invasive esophagectomy to open esophagectomy. And this particular study was focusing on the cancer long-term outcomes. They were looking at three-year endpoints. And again, they said that basically the disease-free and three-year survival for open and MIE were equivalent. And these results, together with the short-term results, suggests that 
uh, support the use of minimally invasive techniques for esophageal cancer. And again, I know there's a lot of strong opinions out there, a lot of different practices, but at least this is some uh, phase three data that's looking at the oncologic outcomes between the two. Okay, in the annals of thoracic surgery, um, Again, you're going to think this is interesting which articles I picked, but there's not a good way to look. Some articles are really good at showing you most downloaded and most cited. It's kind of hard to find that. You can only find it for like the history of the annals of thoracic surgery, what's the most cited. And by the way, the most cited journal article for the history of the annals of thoracic surgery is the Lung Cancer Study Group trial comparing wedge versus lobe. I think it had like 1,500 citations or something. Um, but for the last year, these were some papers that came up, and some of this came from Mark Ferguson looking at his journal, a new scan that he does for CTSNet, and this was one that he had suggested. This is a paper from uh, Moshe Lieberman and his colleagues in Canada, and they were looking at the use of uh, a harmonic scalpel for pulmonary artery sealing, and this is an issue a lot of people sort of wondered about. Can we safely use a harmonic scalpel for vessels? Most of us are kind of scared to do it, to be frank, but... Um, I'm going to back up for a second. So they had 37 patients that they started with, and several people were excluded because they converted to open for other reasons, for tumor or what have you. And eventually they ended up with about 20 patients that underwent VATS uh, lobectomies in which they used the harmonic scalpel. And this is just to give you an idea, a picture of them taking a smaller vessel, and I think they were really careful to measure the vessels that they used to make sure they were within a certain size range. And if you look at which vessels they actually divided, they were allowed to go up to seven millimeters, but they really, they kind of, well, chickened out a little bit, and they really mostly focused on four millimeters or less. Um, but I'm just showing you what the data is. And then I have a movie, if you're ready to show that, Frank. Um, and I, this gave me a little bit of chest pain, I'm gonna warn you. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that gives me chest pain. Somebody better go resuscitate and Alan in the back no. of the room. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go back to the slideshow. So they did not have any explosions. <laughs> and they did re-explore a few patients for bleeding, but it was not from that. They said it was from lymph node basin or port site or what have you, but they didn't have any re-explorations for bleeding in the 20 patients in which this was used. I'm just curious by a show of hands, how many of you are using energy devices during your VATS lobectomies? Okay, wow, um, that's impressive. So, I mean, I think it is, it sounds like it is definitely percolating into practice, something to think about, yeah? Oh yeah, I'm sorry, how many are using it on the PA? <laughs> okay, maybe it's a little bit fewer, but still quite a bit. And I'm curious, are you guys going up to seven millimeters? Do you have a size cutoff? <laughs> so you use a stapler for most things, and then for the little tiny ones you use this. Okay. Well, anyway, so, I mean, I think this is potentially practice changing. There really wasn't much data to say if this was safe or okay to do, and this is the beginnings of that. And so that the, if we go into the next slide, um, I don't know if you need to, oh, there we go. So the conclusions were that PA branch sealing for vessels seven millimeters or less, and realize again, they only did one vessel that was seven millimeters, was uh, safely achieved with harmonic device, and prospective multi-institutional studies are necessary before widespread clinical application. So I don't know, maybe this is something we could do through the TSOG or through the GTSE, but this is a surgical question. Maybe this is the type of thing we ought to be doing. Um, <clears throat> Okay, another paper that was brought up as being impactful is this paper also from uh, McGill from Canada, looking at the economic impact of an enhanced recovery pathway in thoracic surgery. And this paper is interesting because their version of economic impact was not quite what I thought when I read the title. And of course, in the Canadian health system, it's very tough to look at their economics compared to United States economics. But they actually looked at things like how much time the caregivers took off of work, how quickly the patient went back to work. So it was a very different endpoints than I normally thought of. But they did show um, several things that they had 133 patients over about two years, that their length of stay was shorter, 
less complications, less pulmonary complications, no difference in readmissions, and there was less caregiver burden in the enhanced recovery group by trend, but not significant. And the overall societal costs were potentially about 4,000 or so different in terms of societal costs. So, and I'll just mention a paper I just uh, presented is now online, but not yet published for the um, annals that we looked at more sort of United States economics, and we definitely showed a substantial cost savings. I'll be talking more about that tomorrow. So I think this is one of many we're going to start seeing and hearing more about enhanced recovery in thoracic surgery. I think it's something that will be practice changing in the future. And another paper, I would say, after giving my talk at the Southern, I can't tell you how many people have come up to me to talk about how they want to use Expirel in their practice. They have trouble getting it approved. This is another paper that, and if you're interested, I can give you a stack of papers or I can email you a, a file of papers that maybe will help you get Expirel approved at your institution. This is another step closer to that, coming from the MD Anderson group looking at, uh, I don't have the number, but I think it was, uh, I don't know, close to a thousand patients that had um, Expirel as part of their procedure and showing no safety concerns with using it. So again, m one of many papers coming out showing that it is okay to use this, and I think we just have to build up an armamentarium that we can then go to our hospital administrators to get it approved because some people are struggling. Yes, normal. Looking at their slide deck, uh, it was like three or four patients, and the, the slide deck doesn't talk about who injected and for what procedure. It might have been for a femoral uh, block or something, and it, everything in, went in IV. So we, we don't know. So that caused my uh, pharmacy uh, committee to send me a couple of emails. So y you might get some resistance if you're trying to go forward. Yes, uh, and I plus, agree. there's one European trial that is negative results and, um, and looking at their methodology, it's multi-institution. They didn't inject anywhere close to what the MD Anderson group or uh, other groups with positive results have uh, put out. So a couple of disclaimers, uh, you might get some resistance from your hospitals. Yeah, as it turns out, I know what the, uh, the, the six reported fatalities were from. Um, four of the six were unrelated. One patient received uh, probably an intravascular rejection, injection of uh, several different uh, agents, including lidocaine and ropivacaine, as well as liposomal bupivacaine. And, um, and uh, I, the last one, I just don't remember. But, but the bottom line is that the MD Anderson guys are right. It's uh, you know, a mixture of combination of liposomal bupivacaine and bupivacaine is going to be a big uh, help for us in our patients. So, so stay tuned. It's not coming off the shelves or anything like that that I've heard. I think it, my understanding is that the presentation to the FDA was suboptimal and it probably could have gone a different direction. I, I've heard this through the grapevine. But so I'm going to move on to the JTCVS. And so I looked. It's, this is kind of, it was kind of interesting. What are the top articles from the JTCVS? And I know we have an editor from the JTCVS in the room. Um, but they have this thing called Plum X Metrics. I'd never heard of it before, but it came up on a couple of other websites. It's kind of interesting. It looks at the top social media articles. And I am not a big social media person, but I think we all have to embrace it more than we have. I, I seem to recall Rose Gannam had her first tweet at the last meeting. <laughs> last year <laughs> but this plum x metric people are using it and it's showing up on a lot of major journals and it looks at usage captures mentions facebook posts tweets and then citations which we're more used to hearing about so it looks at scopus and so forth and then you get like a different size of the little color bubble depending on how much anyway shocking but this is out there so I went by what is the Plumex metrics for these journals for the last year and a half, and 
there were, of the thoracic-oriented articles, I was shocked at what was the highest PLUMX metrics. Bilateral pneumonectomy to treat uncontrolled sepsis awaiting lung transplant, a case report, basically, uh, from the Toronto group, and they had a patient with cystic fibrosis who was horribly septic waiting for lungs. They took both of her lungs out, put her on ECMO, and then transplanted her later. And that paper got more attention than almost anything else. Uh, so it lets you know the number of captures, mentions, it gives you the whole rating down here. <clears throat> so there were 20 tweets or something and 34 on Facebook. There you go. The next one was bilateral sympathectomy improves post-infarction left ventricular remodeling and function. And I included this because we're the sympathectomy doctors. So I'm wondering if our heart failure docs are going to ask us to do this. And then I read the paper more closely, and this was in... Um, mice, <laughs> and that got um, 66 Facebook or 68 Facebook shares, <laughs> but this was, again, there were five or six articles listed under JTCVS, and these were the two thoracic papers, and then the third one was by our own Mara Antonoff and Nikki Stamp on the New Yorker cover challenge, and this was a whole move where female surgeons took their pictures with an OR light behind them sort of showing female surgical strength, and this was the third most important article in the JTCVS. There you go. Moving on to the New England Journal of Medicine. <laughs> um, Pacific trial we talked about already. In case you missed it, this is showing an inoperable stage three lung cancer using uh, dravalumab after chemo radiation, improved progression-free survival. We talked about this already. We still don't know about long-term survival benefit. And then most recently, there's a trial that I think we also need to be aware of. No, it's not surgical, but it's called the FLORA trial. They get the cutest names, you know, flowers, oceans, whatever. Okay, so the FLORA trial <clears throat> is looking at patients with EGFR mutations. And these are all, it was a phase three double-blinded trial. These are all stage four patients, but EGFR mutants. And we normally think of erlotinib or tarceva or gefitinib or Aresa as being the standard drugs, and they uh, compared those drugs to osimertinib, which is, I don't even know what the trade name is, but osimertinib, I'll just tell you, is different from those other drugs because it has central nervous system penetration, and the other ones don't do that very well, and obviously these patients all get brain meds. But importantly, it practically doubled the uh, progression-free survival. So it was a really big difference. This is a huge deal in the world of medical oncology. It's being talked about a lot. And all of those drug developments happen in stage four, and then they make it into our space. So we have to keep track of what's happening. And I just emailed this morning to Tom Stinchcomb, who heads the respiratory group from the Alliance, because the Alchemist trial is using erlotinib, and I just wonder if we need to be switching to osimertinib. If we found a better drug to treat that mutation, why aren't we using it? I think there's discussion, but it gets into contract issues and drug company support. But, you know, if we're going to use erlotinib as an adjuvant drug for our patients, maybe we should use the drug that works better. So I'm betting we're going to hear more about this. Okay, looking at the Journal of American College of Surgeons, um, we want to keep up with what's happening there. They also use Plum X metrics, I was surprised to see. And these were the five papers that had anything possibly to do with thoracic surgery, and I'm going to focus on three of them. And this was physician or resident burnout was one of the most important articles. And the long and short of it was that we should be using mindfulness to help our residents not have burnout. And actually, we probably all should be using mindfulness. But I mentioned this. I'm sort of laughing, but I'm not laughing. I think we all have to be aware of these things. Burnout is a major issue. It affects up to half of all surgeons, both in training and in practice. And mindfulness practices are things that help. If you haven't heard of it or tried it, it's worth doing. My institution has all kinds of mindfulness classes, and they're really kind of great. So. But this one got 900 tweets, and it's only been published for about a month. So a lot of attention. The next one is what hat do we wear on our head in the operating room? I couldn't believe that this got so much attention and is one of the most important articles in the Journal of American College of Surgeons. But it turns out I should be switching from the bouffant to the skull cap because I've always worn the bouffant. And they looked at all kinds of stuff like microorganisms and penetrability of the hat, and they compared it to freshly washed 
cloth caps and all kinds of stuff, but the bottom line is we're supposed to wear skull caps. So there you go. And this got 600 something tweets. Okay, and this one is also important, and I'm gonna take this to my boss, damn it. Um, <laughs> this is looking at the gender salary gra gap in surgery. And they, when they corrected for specialty, age, faculty rank, and metrics of clinical and research productivity, female physicians make 20,000 less than male physicians. That's not okay. And when we looked specifically at subspecialties, and they looked at neurosurgery, cardiothoracic surgery, uh, female surgeons make $44,000 less than men for no good reason, except our gender. So you guys need to know about this, think about it, whether you're the one feeling the brunt of it, or if you're someone who's in a position to pay salaries, you should be aware of this. Um, and then lastly, the Journal of Thoracic Oncology uh, has a paper coming out, it's not published yet, but it was shared with me sort of ahead of publication. And it turns out that they do this paper every year, this is the third year they've done it, and I would encourage you to read it when it comes out. I think it's gonna be a really good manuscript, but I couldn't include everything here. But several people in this room were authors on it. And this is looking at all aspects of early stage lung cancer and what's the most important things that have come out in the past year. So here's a few highlights. Um, they looked at smoking status, and in Asia, interestingly, they're seeing that up to 25% of um, non-smokers, uh, of all lung cancers in Asia, up to 25% are in non-smokers. So it's a much higher proportion than we're used to seeing, and they think that the mechanisms may be completely different than we're used to. At first, it was thought maybe it's pollution-related, but it may be totally different genetic mechanisms that are leading to this. So I think we're going to hear more about that. <clears throat> Betty Tong wrote a section in this article about lung cancer screening and what's happening. The Nelson trial isn't out yet, but will be coming. But one of the major messages is that all this effort that we're doing for implementation of screening, um, we're not doing enough. We, the implementation is really poor. It's some tiny percentage, I think single digit percentage of all those eligible for screening that are getting screening. So efforts need to be made there. Um, and even around the globe, there's still issues with implementation and impact and, and population differences there. So in terms of pathology, there's more and more coming out about what our tissue needs to be sent for. In some ways, I think that's not our problem as surgeons, but in some way, I think we have to be captain of the ship and make sure it's being done correctly. Some institutions have reflex testing and they make it easy for you, but some places you have to kind of advocate to make sure that testing's being done correctly, and they just keep adding more and more things that we need to be testing. So there's ROS1 should now be mandatory, ERB2, MET, BRAF, there's now BRAF targeted therapy, KRAS, RET, uh, next generation sequencing, um, and then there's options to how you're gonna do your ALK and ROS testing, T790M, I mean, the list goes on, but it's, it's important, it seems like a lot, but it, these are things that are making really huge differences in outcomes for lung cancer patients. And NCCN guidelines do periodically update what should be reflexively tested. Um, there was a section on new image guiding techniques for lung resection, so there's something called IVATS where you use CT scans in your operating room and put fiducials to help you do wedge resections or to do diagnostic wedges as part of an initial uh, evaluation of an abnormal lymph uh, nodule, use of infrared technology, molecular, there's actually molecular targeting for mapping, if you can believe that. If you know they're an EGFR mutant tumor, there's agents you can give that are EGFR targeted that will make the thing light up. So pretty cool stuff coming. I don't think it's necessarily prime time yet, but coming along. Um, <clears throat> Getting back to what we talked about earlier, some quality measures relating to wedge resections. And the NCDB published something that 92% of the wedge resections done have negative margins. We could be doing better. We probably should be checking those margins so that it's 100%. Um, and 46% no lymph nodes taken. I think we've talked a lot about that already this morning, but this, this is what's coming up. This is what people are talking about. We can argue about whether that's important or not. Um, continued efforts at enhancing the quality and extent of lymph node dissection and evaluation, and Ray O actually wrote the section on this in the paper. So again, that's getting a lot of attention. 
And then um, some other interesting stuff coming out. People are looking at using circulating tumor DNA to help decide who gets adjuvant therapy or not. I think that's very provocative. We know, we're tr- we, know we should give adjuvant therapy because it improves survival by 5 to 15%, but obviously a lot of those people would do fine without it. Maybe we can get better at refining who goes on to adjuvant and who doesn't. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, I think a lot of people have those ideas, it's still very premature, but it is becoming pretty regular in the stage four space. But another thing we have to pay attention to because we need to start bringing that into the early stage, more resectable space. And then lastly, I just wanted to make a plug for a couple of things that you should know about. Number one is this podcast called the Lung Cancer Updates. Do any of you listen to that? Oh my God, only one person. I'm just going to tell you, I listen to this all the time, and it is very med- medical oncology heavy, but I learned so much from those podcasts. It's, it's amazing. There are these in-depth interviews by this guy named Dr. Neil Love. <laughs> he talks kind of like that. But he does these in-depth interviews with our medical oncology colleagues, and I learn so much every time I listen to it. If you're stuck in traffic, put this on your iPhone, listen to it. It is so helpful and so interesting. I urge you to listen to it. And in fact, Dennis and I have talked about maybe we need to advocate a little bit more and get some more surgical topics on there or at least multidisciplinary. But it's a really great podcast, and I urge you to listen to it. And then the last thing I want to bring to your attention is this new effort that's being sponsored by the American Cancer Society. We had our inaugural inaugural meeting in December in Bethesda, and it's called the National Lung Cancer Roundtable. There's already a national colon cancer roundtable. It's been around for like 20 years. And they're just finally realizing maybe we need to do this for lung cancer. Uh, but it is led by our own surgeon, Doug Wood, and Ella Kazaruni, who is a radiologist. It's sponsored by the American Cancer Society. Um, and here are some pictures of the surgeon contingent that was there. Uh, this is the group shot, and then Doug insisted on a selfie. <laughs> Um, but it's a, it's a brand new thing. It's an effort by the American Cancer Society to try to make a difference in lung cancer outcomes. A lot of the efforts are focused, as you might imagine, on screening, which makes sense because that's a more digestible message, more uh, widely distributable message. But there's also efforts on some other things that aren't just screening, for example, tumor markers and what should be standard of care. But literally just by showing up, several of us became task force leaders of this you know, there's probably six or seven task forces that are being formed, and we're generating information. And it's everything from how to implement screening, how to make sure that there's not racial disparities in who's being offered screening. And then once the screening is done, how are those results being handled? Are they being handled appropriately? Are they getting referred to thoracic surgeons or pulmonologists? And in what time frame? And are they getting the therapies that they should be getting? Um, so there's a lot of things, a lot of chance, and, and a whole bunch of engagement of policymakers too. So this is an opportunity for us to change the course of what's happening with lung cancer care in this country. So if you're interested in getting involved, it's at the very beginning stages. And I'd be happy to talk to you, but really probably Doug Wood would be the best person to contact if you're interested in getting involved. And that's all I got. <laughs>